Thank you all for joining us, whether you're here in person or online. I'm just going to start with a couple of uh, announcements since we're doing a hybrid event. For everybody online, all the lines will be muted. Uh, if you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A box, not the chat, and then we will take questions for all three uh, speakers at the very, very end. Um, if you are on Zoom, you will get a short one-minute survey, so if you fill it out, that'd be very helpful for us to tailor these talks that they're most useful for y'all. Um, and then everybody here in the room, you'll get, a, get an email, and please, uh, please uh, fill that out as well to help us out. Um, so my name is Tim Farinold. I'm a field application scientist at uh, Twist Bioscience, and I'm going to kind of run through a little bit about uh, how Twist may be able to help you achieve your goals with next generation sequencing. So Twist is relatively new to the NGS space. About 2018 is when we IPO'd and released our first uh, whole exome um, that performed very, very well. But it's based on this core technology that we can print oligos on silicon wafers. So traditional Oligosynthesis happens in a 96 well plate where each well is a single oligo. Well, in that same footprint, we're able to print up to a million oligos. And this is not only high throughput, but it's very accurate. So using that core technology, we've applied that to kind of everything under the sun. So we started with synthetic biology with clonal genes. If you're doing expression vectors, knockout vectors, anything you need to you put it into a, a plasmid, for instance. Uh, oligo pools, we do combinatorial variant libraries. Uh, we have a data storage department and uh, Biopharma division that does high throughput, high throughput antibody screening. But today we're just going to talk about what our, our NGS offerings are. And our, our main component is doing target enrichment. And this is the idea that you don't need to sequence all of the DNA molecules in your sample. Instead, you have a list of targets or say an exome uh, that you want to reach in and pull out and only sequence that. And what that allows you to do is drastically reduce the amount of data that you need to, or reads you need to dedicate to a single sample, going from a whole genome where you need 90 gigabases down to a whole exome where you only need seven and a half gigabases to reach 20X coverage. Um, and this allows you to not only fit more samples on your, uh, your lane of choice, but also sequence more deeply for say CFDNA applications where you need 10,000, 20,000 X coverage, you're able to achieve that in a, in a cost efficient way. Now, there's a bunch of other companies on the market that do target enrichment. It's not a, a novel technology, but Twist outperforms them in pretty much every capture metric you look at. And this starts with the fact that we ship double-stranded DNA probes, unlike some other competitors that may ship single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA probes. And they're highly efficient at capturing. We can handle about 10 base pairs of mismatch in our 120 base pair probes before we see any sort of reduction in, in efficiency. Um, we also NGSQC all of our probe panels. So this is whether it's an off-the-shelf exome or a custom panel we've, we've designed for you. We will throw that on a sequencer, ensure you that you know all of the uh, the probes that you ordered and that you want are going to be in that panel when you ultimately receive it. And they uh, result in a very uniform capture. And this is the idea that all of your targets are getting the same amount of coverage across the entire panel, and you're not getting over under sequence of different targets, um, which again is, is performed as a much more efficient capture that way. Our entire workflow that goes end to end is highly flexible. So we can go from very small panels, you know, a couple hundred probes up to millions and millions of probes with our 123 megabase human methylome panel, which is extremely large. Um, we also have kit modularity. So if you already have, say, a robust library prep backlog that you have up and running in the lab, well, you can just tack on a, a twist hybrid capture on the end of that, and it'll just work seamlessly with your current lab workflow. Um, but the goal of all these, all these um, improvements is to lower your sequencing costs. Like I said, more samples onto your lane or deeper sequencing is, is possible. So this is what we're trying to avoid when we're doing efficient uniform hybrid captures. If you have these three targets here in gray and you're targeting at 30X depth of coverage for these three targets, anything over 30X is semi-wasted. You don't need that much data to, to call your variants in those, in those exons, for example. So that could have gone to say this third target, which is under-sequenced, which you can't call your variants because you don't have the confidence of 30X coverage that you needed. And then you obviously always want to avoid off target where your probe is binding to some sequence that you don't want to pull, pull down. So our highly efficient probes, like I said, are, are double stranded. And this is just the, the benefits of having a double stranded DNA probe. So you're capturing both strands of DNA. And this not only increases your library complexity, so you're not sequencing duplicates all the time, uh, but it also allows you to have a little bit more information for variants. You can confirm them on both strands and have a lot more confidence in your calls. 
Another way that we're achieving this, this uniform efficient captures with our, with our panels is with our ability to vary uh, probe concentrations based on GC content in the target. So unlike some competitors where you see in their exome, you get this extremely more, like a much more efficient capture in high GC because it's just a stronger bond in the, in the uh, hybridization process. Uh, we can actually vary the probe so that you get this uniform capture. So you're not getting this under sequencing down here and this over sequencing in the high GC so that you're, um, you're, you're capturing everything at the, at the same level. And this uniformity, um, across the GC spectrum is the actual measurement that we can statistically calculate. So just looking at how we stack up against other other competitors, since there's a lot of a lot of people in this space, um, we measure uniformity by the fold 80 base penalty, which is just the idea. It's a measurement of how over or under sequenced your your entire run was. Um, our new XM 2.0 performs way better than anyone else in the in the space at 1.28, which is an extremely low um, uniformity. Um, and one would be like a perfectly uniform capture. Um, our on-target rate is better than everyone. Uh, zero coverage targets. So these are a target, say, that doesn't have any reads assigned to it. So 0.73% with our XM 2.0. And if you're targeting a sort of normal depth of coverage for an X, say 30X, um, we're, we're, we're leaving the pack with around 98% um, on, on target rate. So if you're, say, not wanting to do an exome, you don't want to do all the sequencing, and you want a really, really targeted small panel that you want to design, we have an excellent team that works with you. So you work with myself, you work with your account manager, and our bioinformatics team. And we take your design. So this can be in any form. We accept gene names, coordinates, CPG sites, any information you can give us about this, um, your targets. We ingest those in about a a day, two days, we can have your, your panel designed. You get a bed file showing exactly what, where it's targeting. Um, you get some information about some probes that might be targeting a little bit too repetitive a site. So we might want to drop those out to avoid off target. Uh, ultimately, you, you purchase it, build it. You can actually run a, a test run and send us fast cues directly off your sequencer. And we will ingest that, run all of those same metrics that we saw on the previous slide and let you know how your capture performed and say if you have a little bit of you know too high off target then you can work with me at the wet bench level and tune some things in our protocols to improve that and kind of pick and choose what what metrics you want to improve um, in, in the process I mentioned our end-to-end -end solution so this is post DNA extraction or um, or cDNA um, synthesis up to loading on your favorite sequencer of choice uh, we have multiple different fragmentation Method. So we work with mechanical fragmentation, whether you're using Cobaris or Mega Ruptor for long read. Um, and we have our own enzymatic fragmentation kit. We have 384 currently, we're going to have more soon, 384 UDIs. Um, and that can be paired with our new UMI adapters for error correction. We have multiple different enrichment protocols. So you can do a standard hybridization, which takes 16 hours overnight, or we have our fast hive, which is two to four hours if you want to get everything done in a single day. We also have a robust catalog of um, off-the-shelf panels, so exomes, methylomes, we've got some pan cancer um, alliance panels, and then we always offer our custom panels. And these custom panels, we work with all types of inputs, so you can do RNA designs, methylation designs, um, or you know, kind of, we'll, we'll work with any species, viruses, anything we can design in any space. So to kind of begin with some of our newer products, our UMI adapters. So these are specifically designed for CDF DNA applications, but they can be used in really any application where you want to drastically reduce your error rate. These are, these are drop into our protocol. They drop in right at the adapter ligation step. And these are 32 matched UMI pairs um, that work, work with our UDIs to give you about a 10 to the fourth reduction in error rate. So gray is without UMI. Uh, duplex collapse and the, the green shows you're down at 10 to the minus eight for, for area after that. And this is very important when you're trying to make those calls, those really, really rare variants in your, in your samples. These are often paired with our um, CFDNA pan cancer control. So these are controls you would, you would use alongside your samples to determine your limit of detection. They're offered in uh, various allele frequencies from 0% up to 5%. They consist of 160 oligos per variant, and this is how they're tiled across the variant site. So they're not all in the same spit in the same spot. They include um, uh, SNVs, indels, 
um, and they're actually spiked into a background of donor CFDNA. This is a fully characterized CFDNA donor background. And what, what's beneficial of that is that other people in the, in the field, they actually spike it into just a cell line DNA background. But with this, you actually get an accurate representation of what, say, that variant would look like in an actual CFDNA sample. So it's much more representative of the rest of your samples. So we have people that determine their LOD, and then they run this along with, you know, occasionally with their, their runs to make sure they're still able to detect, say, that 0.1% um, allele frequency over time. We also have a, a targeted methylation solution. We went with a pre-capture conversion uh, protocol, which means that you're actually converting all of the um, non-methylated Cs prior to doing your capture. What this allows you to do is, is not only retain greater library complexity, but actually have lower input into the system because we can do an intermediate amplification step and not lose those methylation markers anymore. Um, as opposed to a post-capture conversion, which the really the only benefit is that you can use a panel that was designed for DNA space to also capture those for, for uh, methylation. Uh, but it uh, is a much less complex library. How we have achieved this is we've taken on the burden of designing probes for this. Um, how we do this is we take every CPG site, we consider it fully unmethylated or fully methylated. Then we do in silico conversion and PCR, and we design in this post-PCR state. And what we do is we ship you eight probes per target, and that allows you to capture 0% to 100% methylation and everything in between, because again, our probes can capture some mismatches. So if you have slightly unmethylated, slightly methylated samples, you're, you can catch everything in between. This has been paired with NEB's EMSeq enzymatic conversion kit for library prep. We worked with um, NEB to optimize this for, for twist captures. Um, really simply, you do an oxidation step followed by an Apobec enzymatic conversion. And this uh, retains a lot more of your input DNA. With bisulfite sequencing, where you see a ton of degradation, like sometimes up to 90% of your DNA is gone, this also helps us put less DNA into the system, and you get to retain, you call more CPG sites, you retain more of your, your, your information in your sample. You also get better captures outright, so as, as well as a better a library prep, the captures perform better. So whether you're looking at uh, you know, depth of coverage, your uniformity, your off bait, your duplication rate, they're all going to perform better than if you did the same thing with, with bisulfite conversion. We recently released a uh, large twist human methylome panel. Now, this is its comparison with the Epic A50K because that's kind of what it's, what it's targeting to replace. It's a huge panel. Like I said, it's 123 megabases. It targets uh, 3.9, about 4 million CPG sites. Um, in the field, we're seeing people call anywhere from six and a half to 7 million CPG sites when they run this with their samples. Um, so you get, you're getting a lot more information than, say, an array, which methylation arrays notoriously have a, a lot of problems as it is. Uh, finally, I want to briefly touch on our, our new uh, partnership with PacBio for a long read target enrichment. You'll hear a lot more about this from Fritz. Um, this was designed to work with SQL 2 or SQL 2 e machines. We have optimized our, our probe design for custom panels for long read. This in, takes into account the, our ability to um, look at GC content and shift probes based on that, as well as just generally being able to move probes a lot further than in a short read 1x tiling um, strategy. And we can do this in DNA space or RNA space. The protocol looks super familiar, post-shearing DNA in what we suggest is a megareptor or G-tubes. Uh, you go through the same process as any sort of true seek style library prep with some changes in how much time you're doing for extension. The PCRs are different. Uh, we have some suggested um, polymerase for, 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 doing, for accomplishing that. Once you do all this, we can do an eight-plex capture like our normal captures for long read. Um, and then you'll run straight into PacBio Smart Bell Library Prep and then load it on your, your SQL, SQL 2. Um, and you can uh, multiplex 24 samples on a single smart cell. To kind of briefly show some, some data from uh, these uh, captures, we partnered with Leiden University in Germany. Uh, we designed a pharmacogenomics panel. It's two megabases. Those are the, the genes we targeted. Uh, so 23 genes. They were uh, multiplex 24 on the smart cell. We saw 190 fold enrichment with 94% greater than 20x coverage. When we looked at um, star allele assignment, we saw 100% uh, concordance with 24 reference uh, samples at all loci tested. 
And this is a look at what the uh, call pileup in IGV looks like. So this is just haplotype phasing for uh, over 50 variant positions in a 50 KV region um, and our ability to haplotype um, when in the DPYD gene. Um, so with that, I don't want to take up any of our more time for our speakers. Um, I want to um, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Don Johan. He comes to us from the University of Arkansas Medical School. Prior to that, he was at the NIH at the National Cancer Institute. He is the per, he's a professor and the scientific director at UAMS's genomics sequencing facility. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about how um, the uh, landscape of precision oncology has uh, developed. So please help me welcome Dr. Don Johan. All right. So thank you, Tim. And I'd also like to thank uh, TWIST for inviting me, especially uh, Lulu Wang, who I work with a lot, and Clay Morrison, who's our FAS, who we uh, frequently uh, speak with. And so <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of background on me, I'm, I'm a medical oncologist, but I became a physician as a second career. I first worked in engineering for seven years for one of the big engineering firms on the East Coast, where we did all sorts of very advanced uh, avionic uh, software design for uh, uh, U.S. and NATO countries, and uh, then I went to medical school in Cleveland <clears throat> and um, put together a nice talk for you today. So let's uh, get going. And towards the end of this, I'll show you a very interesting clinical trial that I've been the uh, PI on in the state of Arkansas for the last five years, and it's, uh, it concerns lung cancer, and we've collected, we've enrolled about 200 patients in it, and um, Interestingly, uh, I had, when I first launched this clinical trial, I had, uh, I'll just say, uh, a little bit of issues with some of my fellow medical oncologists buying into this, but the surgeons just loved it. So uh, what wound up happening is, since we're the only academic center in the state, uh, we wound up enrolling a lot of people with uh, early stage disease where we operate on them for cure. So that's stage one through 3A. So uh, we have a lot of matched samples now from the solid tumor and then liquid samples over time. So this longitudinal assessment of preoperative samples, postoperative, and then at standard of care visits. So we'll go through that at the end and the, the twist technologies that I'm using for that. And we're starting to run that now. So um, we're going to talk about the evolving uh, landscape of precision oncology, where we were, where we're now, and where we need to go. So here's a picture of uh, Louis Pasteur. So it was just a little bit over 100 years ago where uh, Professor Pasteur was being literally laughed out of meetings by his colleagues because of his new uh, germ theory uh, of, of disease. So, um, but not everybody was laughing. Joseph Lister read Pasteur and started to apply his, uh, his theories by uh, cleaning his instruments with carbolic acid, with, which sterilizes them. And Lister's uh, outcomes uh, uh, started to really uh, dramatically improve compared to his colleagues. There were much less wound infections and patients just did better. So, um, that's just a little bit over 100 years ago. This is a high-resolution photomicrograph of DNA from a cell. And if we look at that and unwind all the DNA and connect it, it it's about six feet or six meters. And we still don't understand how this degree of compression is achieved to get this all inside the nucleus. So there's a, a lot to learn. but. You know, everything today in this new field of molecular medicine is really based on DNA and the products of DNA. So cancer medicine is uh, shifting very quickly. It's going from a descriptive type medicine to one that's molecular based, uh, based on mechanisms and pathways from empirical diagnoses to mechanism based diagnoses and therapies from an organ based discipline where you talk about the cancer arising in a certain organ, the breast, the colon, the prostate, the lung, et cetera, to one where we're now classifying these cancers, not necessarily by the organ of origin, but by the molecular driver. We're looking at these cancers like a deranged circuit because it is a deranged biological circuit. And we're looking to intervene 
in a meaningful way through a, a rational assignment of the therapeutics. So from categorical treatments where you look it up in a book, somebody has breast cancers of this type, they get this treatment, the one where it's individualized in a very rational manner. From looking at retrospective diagnoses to prospectively evaluating now somebody's relative risk of disease. Okay, so this is now moving into screening where we can now pick up things much earlier. Also, we can look at a patient's germline and we can almost start to prognosticate that given certain life, lifestyles, they're more likely to have these sort of problems, diseases. So maybe intervening very early and getting people to steer away from certain, uh, certain sort of uh, habits, et cetera. Why is it that only 10 to 15 people, 10 to 15% of people who smoke actually get lung cancer? Why is that? They don't have the genetic constitution to handle it. Maybe their DNA repair isn't as robust as, as other people, so they can't handle all these addicts and, they, and be able to repair that. Um, we also want to move from the uh, really acute care of disease where it's very reactionary to prospectively uh, uh, intervening through screening, through meaningful screening, uh, with more advanced molecular assays. So it's a very exciting time. So here's some evolving images of cancer <clears throat> to the, uh, I'm pointing here, this is a bone marrow aspirate of a patient with myeloma. And here you can see these plasma cells with the large eccentric nuclei. And it wasn't that long ago that the diagnosis of myeloma was made just by a bone marrow aspirate and maybe some primitive cytogenetics. But over here, where I'm pointing to is a 70 gene panel that was done by Microarray and actually done at the University of Arkansas by Bart Barlogi and John Shaughnessy, where we can look at gene expression of these 70 key proliferative genes and be able to uh, uh, diagnose and even prognosticate based on the type of subtype. Not all myelomas are the same. We have high risk, intermediate risk, and, and low risk. So again, it's being able to look at that, modulate your therapy appropriately to give patients a better care. And below this, uh, we have an H&E image of an invasive breast cancer, okay? So it wasn't that long ago, 20 years, 25 years ago, where a lot of the diagnoses were just made based on that. And then there was more of a categorical treatment where here, in this picture that I'm pointing to, we're looking at the gene expression of the PAM50 developed by Chuck Perot, where we can now bin or subclassify the breast cancer into whether it's hormonally driven, and even if it is hormonally driven, how proliferative is it? It's a big deal. It's a big difference between a luminal A versus a luminal B. Or is it HER2 enriched, where we can intervene in a meaningful way with a monoclonal antibody? Or is it, there's no uh, expression where it's triple negative, where now today with some of the, you know, should this be chemotherapy or should it be a novel clinical trial with chemotherapy and immunotherapy? And we'll talk about that a little bit on how this, this new fifth modality of cancer is really changing uh, uh, what we're able to offer patients and uh, intervene very meaningfully. So where are we now? Well, one of the big problems that we've had all along using chemotherapy is that the therapeutic index is extremely tight. And what I mean by that is having patients benefit from the therapeutic effect to where you have toxicity is extremely narrow. <clears throat> so the proposed solution of that is we need better biomarkers and let's use genomics for that because the technology is ready now. The price has fallen, and we're able to profile things uh, very effectively, and we're learning more and more that there isn't one type of lung cancer or, or three or four types of lung cancer. There's over 100. We can see this with the molecular profiling. We have a little bit of a lag now that, that the drugs aren't catching up, but, you know, 
every it seems every two or three months I'm looking and there's a new small molecule you know coming out for a, a different subtype of lung cancer or, or other cancers. So things are accelerating in, in that as well. So if you wanted to have a cartoon of how uh, what the precision oncology is all about, it's that when we first see a patient, we would like to sample that tumor. We would like to do extensive molecular profiling of the tumor and do a very rational analysis of that on a molecular level, and then be able to intervene with a therapeutic plan customized for that patient in a very meaningful way. Okay. And in the case of relapse or therapeutic resistance, again, we want to be able to sample that tumor again, do the multiomic profiling, study it like a deranged circuit, and then again, intervene rationally with a therapeutic plan for that individual patient. We now have the technologies and the abilities to do that. So driving this all is really the cost of the genome. Here's a graph where we show, we're comparing the cost of the genome compared to Moore's law. And really nothing in science has ever outpaced Moore's law. And being an, an engineer and living that environment and getting more powerful computers every 12 to 18 months, it was like you know Christmas uh, every year or two getting getting a new toy to play with. Well, with, look, look at the sequence. What happened here in 2007? What happened here that really was this precipitous drop? Well, we had the introduction of next generation sequencing, better described as multi-parallel sequencing, where we're doing millions of reactions simultaneously. And that parallelism allows the cost to drop tremendously. <clears throat> and so now we can do, uh, you know, we can sequence a person's genome for about $1,000 in a day, and we can do that right in Arkansas. Of course, you've been able to do it here in Texas for a long time, but, you know, everyone can do that. Um, and now with some of the new technologies coming out, uh, the, the price is going to drop to $200. So what this is happening is, you know, this is causing these sort of approaches to ram their way into the clinic, okay? It's just ramming its way into the clinic. So it's very disruptive, but the type, the specificity of what we're seeing here is so different and so uh, game-changing that um, it's, it's just simply remarkable. It's also changing the way we do clinical trials. So no, no longer again is it the organ of origin, each of these colors here kind of represents a different molecular driver. So it's, it's, it's the molecular drivers that you want to look at with these. So we, we've developed these bucket or basket trials where it doesn't really matter what the organ of origin is. It's all about what the molecular makeup of the tumor is about. And then that's how uh, the uh, therapeutic plans are done and how the patients are, are better managed. So this is especially important in lung cancer since uh, patients are much older. They're usually the average age 68, and they have other comorbidities. Most of them are smokers, so they have heart disease, they have COPD. And many times the diagnosis is made just by uh, a little needle biopsy, and we get a psychology specimen, and we're able to say yes, this patient has lung cancer, but it might be too risky. As a physician, you're always balancing this risk-benefit ratio. You don't want to hurt the patient. We want to intervene as much as we can, but we may not have enough tissue to actually genotype the tumor. And with non-small cell lung cancer, being able to genotype the tumor and see if it may be amenable to small molecule uh, interventions is extremely important because trying to Get a patient through a platinum doublet, especially when they're uh, older and have all these other comorbidities, most of the times is nearly impossible. You know, the patients start telling you, you know, I I've had enough. I've had enough. You know, they lose their hair. They they're fatigued. Life is just rough compared to these small molecules where if, if you do have a match, 
Um, the uh, toxicity profiles are usually diarrhea, rash, sometimes a little bit of fatigue, but it's radically different. So a lot of them now, these small molecules also, you can maintain that for up to 36 months. The tumor may change, but then we want to go in, resample the tumor and, and see that you are putting pressure, you're putting therapeutic pressure on the tumor. So you have to expect it to, to evolve, but, but let's get ahead of it. Let's resample that. And maybe we just need to revise the drug cocktail. Uh, so this is like I showed you before with the uh, breast and myeloma. This is a uh, <clears throat> all the subtypes for uh, adenocarcinoma, non-small cell uh, of the lung. So all these different subtypes along with the, the drugs. So the uh, development of small molecules has really become uh, a very interesting academic niche where you have a lot of medic medicinal chemists working on this and then partnering with pharma companies. So it's been a real uh, boon. And with the NCCN guidelines now, you are mandated to check for all these biomarkers when a patient is diagnosed with uh, uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And a lot of times, you know, whether it's um, uh, adeno or even sometimes with squamous, you know, you have some bleed over or sometimes you have combinations with the histology. So the important point is, is that compared to chemotherapy, getting treatment from a small molecule is like night and day, all right? So we want to be able to intervene uh, appropriately and, and use this molecular science to to really pin down these diagnoses so we can help people uh, the best way. So now we also have this new cancer modality called immunotherapy. So for anyone who doubts the power of the immune system, all you have to do is look at the hands of somebody with end-stage rheumatoid arthritis, okay? You see the classic ulnar deviation in this picture. This is due to T cells coming in and destroying joint spaces, okay? It's very powerful. In the same way here, I'm gonna show, walk you through here. This is a uh, woman with metastatic melanoma, okay? <clears throat> this is the tumor. It's an exophytic mass. It's growing out from inside of her out to the skin like a mushroom. Okay, this is the CT scan done in a sagittal fashion, right? So we're looking at the patient from the side. It's a sagittal reconstruction. Here's the tumor. Here's her breast. Here's her spine. This is the peritoneal cavity. Here's the tumor between the breast and the stomach wall, this gigantic mass here, okay? This is after one cycle of an immunotherapy cocktail, if you look at that with the volume, okay? The tumor has gone away, most of it, and now where the exophytic mass used to be, we have a crater, right? It's been destroyed. These drugs have reshaped the immune system and woken it up, and the immune system is clearing out the tumor. Just like in your body, if you have a little infection, the immune system comes after that and clears out those pathogens, right? We now have drugs to reshape the immune system so that it goes after tumors. Most people will get cancer five to six times during their life, but usually your immune system is so competent it gets taken care of. You don't even know about it, okay? This is after three treatments, 17 weeks, okay? The one created, created here is now closed would be a secondary intention, right? Now on the CT scan, there's no evidence of disease. This is remarkable. So in the past, somebody with metastatic melanoma like this, with this stage, with this extent of disease, you would expect them to live three to nine months. So as an oncologist, you know, you have a, you have the talk with the patient. You need to get your affairs in order. It's changing now. What we need to change about this is this is only uh, this only works even in for some tumors. We we don't understand why we can't predict up front. Although we have you know all these PDL1 and PD1 
Uh, if you look at it, you know, all these IHC tests, everyone has kind of a different uh, mix on how to do it. We still don't really understand. We can't predict up front who's it going to work with. And really, in the best of cases, the likelihood of a good durable response is about 17 to 20 percent. So we need to understand some of these challenges in the field of uh, computational immuno-oncology to be able to mine through this data quickly and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, have better predictability so we can help even more patients. Now, the liquid biopsy is, is very disruptive. It's really changing the way medical oncology is practiced. It's been the holy grail in medical oncology for the last 50 years. How is it, uh, what exactly in it is it? It's using a routine blood drawer to uh, collect uh, DNA material. So just as, as tumors uh, grow and undergo apoptosis or necrosis for a variety of reasons, they dump their contents into the bloodstream and that includes their DNA. We can now, uh, we have the uh, sensitive enough methods to pick this up and to sequence it and to make sense of it, uh, the somatic mutations and even some of the fragment patterns. It's very powerful and um, it's really changing the way we do things. So it's not just tumors that uh, give off uh, their uh, DNA uh, healthy tissues. You know, our GI tract turns over every 32 uh, 90 days, uh, if you have a little infection, inflammatory, anything that causes cell death will cause things to be uh, dumped, dumped out, the cellular contents, and the blood, in a sense, is kind of like a sewer. Uh, it uh, picks up everything. The half-life of this material is anywhere from uh, 30 minutes to about two hours, has been worked out by the Vogelstein lab. It's eliminated through the kidneys. So um, the blood seems to be a reasonable place uh, to get this. Now, not all tumors uh, do this shedding, so we don't really understand uh, why some tumors do it, like uh, glioblastomas uh, don't notoriously shed, thyroid tumors don't, most GI tumors do, lung cancers do. Uh, so uh, we don't understand all that, but um, for some cancers, it's becoming quite effective. So what we can do is um, longitudinally look at people with liquid biopsy. So in this case here, here's a patient with cancer. So on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is the concentration of CPDNA. Okay. So here the patient had surgery. The surgeon said, I got it all. Right. So if we check the preoperative liquid biopsy, we would see a significant amount of CTDNA. Postoperative, day two, day three, we should see a significant drop off in that. And then we can monitor the patient. Does the patient need adjuvant therapy? Adjuvant therapy means we give people even more therapy after we believe that all the disease has been taken back, gone away, because clinical trials have shown us that this is advantageous. So we notoriously overtreat people. A lot of times oncologists don't know when to stop. And there's all sorts of jokes about that that I'll spare you. <laughs> but in the, we can now with, with the price of sequencing and these assays dropping, we can monitor the patient over time. And we'll talk about this a little bit more into the talk, but we should be able to pick this up if if the tumor starts to grow back, to catch it early and to be in a more meaningful way rather than being reactive and damage control, trying to really uh, uh, continue with this durability more towards a cure. In the same way, if we're treating somebody systemically and we're hitting the target, we're eradicating the tumor, we should see the CT, CT DNA dropping down. Okay. Now, if we monitor them over time, and we can pick things up, and the tumor may have changed. There may be new clones. We know that a lot of times we only partially cure somebody's cancer. We may be wiping out certain clones. Certain clones may be very sensitive to the therapy. Others are resistant, and then they start to grow out. So 
and we can see that with the liquid biopsies. So I like to say that uh, oncologists need to become more like infectious disease doctors. When a, a patient with an infectious disease comes in to see the ID doc, he you know, gets a CBC, maybe some uh, viral markers, et cetera, looks at them, and then individualizes, address, adjusts the cocktail. That's been uh, a lot of the uh, success with HIV AIDS and the way the ID docs have really come around. They had feedback assays. They could customize their therapy based on the HIV, HIV viral load and the CD4 counts and then tweak the drug cocktails appropriately to find that sensitive point to suppress that patient's in HIV infection. They were, you know, that that is really the success, the success story of heart is really the feedback assay that uh, was able to be done. Now with cancer, we have the technology to have feedback assays. Okay. When you give doctors feedback like that, usually remarkable things start happening. So what about uh, liquid biopsy and some of the next steps? Well, pre-analytical variables or how the, pay, how the sample should be collected is very important. And we came out with a publication uh, uh, concerning this uh, just about two years ago. And this is a flow chart on the uh, 11 key things that should be uh, collected during uh, the sample collection process for the blood. You know, this is not real uh, exciting or sexy stuff, but if you don't get it right, everything downstream from that, it's not going to work, right? You have to collect the blood properly. Uh, so we looked at different tubes, whether it be strict tubes with preservatives or without that, how long, uh, you know, all these critical things. So this paper is actually used by the FDA when companies uh, come to them and say, well, you know, we have some aspect of a liquid biopsy assay. What, how should we prove to you that, that our samples are being collected properly? You know, because the FDA is going to want to know right away about the analytical validity. And they say, you have to read this paper and uh, make sure you're doing the right things. <clears throat> the other thing is the analytical validity or for the biomarkers, are they accurate? Are they reproducible? So again, working with national groups, blood pack, uh, we uh, published this in clinical chemistry, which is kind of a very important journal for people who design assays. And this was actually a series of protocols, again, working very closely with FDA. FDA wants to get this right. So they know blood pack is actually a combination of people from academia, from industry, every big uh, pharma company, all the big biotech companies are involved in this. Uh, so we have these 10 different protocols that show you uh, what FDA is really looking for. And so this is another way to uh, speed this technology to the clinic for more robust applications. And then um, I was involved with a, a proficiency study here, this Nature Biotech that came out just a little bit uh, about uh, two years ago where we did a proficiency study, which means that um, we uh, uh, <clears throat> distributed the samples throughout the world to 12 different laboratories and there were different ways of doing it. Now, some of the things that we were worried about, the challenges were this, is that we know that the uh, for liquid biopsy, the DNA input is very low, okay? Uh, the variant allele frequency uh, is usually 1% and below that. And we'll see a little bit more on, on how things uh, work. The DNA fragments are very short, 170 base pairs. Um, there's extensive PCR do, done during this, and that can introduce problems. There are lack of reference samples for benchmarking assays. Okay, so again, having good reference samples so that you can benchmark. I think I built a better mouse trap. What can I do to really test this to uh, see if mine is better than you know this one over here? 
And then what, is, what about the impact of the bioinformatic analyses, all right? We don't want, we did not want to in any way impede innovation, all right? But we do want to provide some standards on which people can plug in to their new assays and do things. So some of the key concepts that we were concerned with was the concordance with tissue sequencing, concordance across laboratories, and then concordance across different liquid biopsy panels or tests. Everyone kind of has their own, you know, is it hybrid capture, is it amplicon based, et cetera. So we took a, um, we made a, a series of cell lines, 10 different cell lines, and then we used the cell line, these 10 cell lines were all from different cancers, and then we used a non-cancerous cell line as, as a dilution factor, and we created two sorts of samples that we call liquid biopsy high and liquid biopsy low, and this is just the dilution uh, levels. The liquid biopsy high was one to five, and the liquid biopsy low was one to 25 dilution. And then we had these different five panels from Roche, Illumina, IDT, Burning Rock, and Thermal Fisher, and then all the bioinformatics. So the bioinformatic analysis could be done however uh, the different participants wanted. There, there were no, uh, no impediments towards that. So this is how it went. Um, you can see every different panel here. We had uh, different labs within that panel, and then there were four replicates. So we had within lab, between lab, then cross-platform, then this one was amplicon-based, all the other ones were hybrid capture-based. So there were, for this study, over 360 CTDNA assays done. All right, so it was pretty comprehensive. And so this is a picture on uh, the performance of the different assays. <clears throat> and so, I, this is starting at here, 2.5% frequency down to 0 0.5. And I'm just going to put your eye at, at all of that. So all of the assays performed pretty well down to 0 0.5. Basically, everybody was getting it right. But let's look at So here's 0 0.5 to 2.5. Everyone's getting it right. 0 0.3 to 3.5. Again, that's the VAF. Just about. Just about everyone's getting it right. Now things start to get, you start to get some wobble in the assays because <clears throat> finding these things, you're, you're having more stochastic phenomena, all right? Finding these uh, little fragments floating around, especially if, you know, how many tube changes are you doing when you're preparing the sample? Uh, th this all becomes very important when you start to look at like, the stoichiometry of, of how much uh, fragments I have actually floating around. And then when we get down to like 0.1%, you know, things are really falling apart. Okay, so we were able to point that out and it was fairly consistent across the different assays and across the world. So this was done in the United States, it was done in China, Australia, and throughout the EU, all right? So a proficiency study done all over the place. All right, because it's very important for liquid biopsy, these assays, to work. It's got to work the same way whether you're in Houston or Bethesda or Los Angeles. All right, so, so where are we going now? So as part of this paper, we were also answered to kind of give a perspective, all right, where, what's been done, where do you see us moving now? So this chart here kind of shows here on the x-axis here, this is metastasis and relapse. And over here, we have areas with early detection, diagnosis, treatment, adjuvant therapy, surveillance. <clears throat> the y-axis here is the concentration of ctDNA in the plasma. The yellow coated area, this is where we are. This is where most of the FDA approvals are, right? It's the patients with advanced disease, right? So the first approval was in 2016 for the COVAS V2 as a companion diagnostic for a, a lot of them, no smurfing. But we've come a long way for that. In 2020, we had two NGS approvals, you know, the uh, garden uh, 
essay and also the uh, Foundation One. But where we need to move now and where clinical trials are doing this is earlier. We want to know how is the response to therapy going? So can we start somebody out on a new therapy? And these ex therapies, some of these small molecules are very expensive, uh, $10,000 to $25,000 per month for the drug. And even if you have a 10 or 20% copay, that's a lot of money, right? So you want to make sure that uh, this is working. And the insurance companies are going to start demanding this. Okay, so we want to start moving into this space and detecting minimal residual disease and screening assays as well. So this, um, we're invited to just uh, deposit all of this uh, data uh, with this uh, Nature Pub. And now, so this is a new area called CTDNA relapse. So if we look at other areas, if somebody has metastatic disease, they're basically incurable. Um, all these areas are curable, and we now have this uh, concept known as CTDNA relapse. You know, so the definition of that is um, somebody has undergone treatment, they've had their high-resolution scans, and there's no evidence of disease. But then when we check the blood, it seems that there's CTDNA there. What does that mean? Well, we're starting to learn in clinical trials that it may, and they're being designed where we either, some arms get the CTDNA profile and some don't, um, that this is indeed important. And in this study here, what we're seeing is <clears throat> this patient population here where the, the colors are a little bit more muted are CTDNA negative. So on, again, on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is your probability of, of survival. And so the people who are CTDNA negative in both overall survival and progression pre survival are doing much better than the people who are positive regardless of whether they're getting the drug or not, all right? So it's very powerful. It means that this is real. We should be able to uh, modulate therapy based on this. And there's more and more drug uh, treatments going on. And this is the slide that I wanted to get to. So here's kind of a schema of what we're doing now as we're starting to process all the samples uh, for this lung cancer trial. So most patient early stage disease, and they've had therapy, standard of care, curative intent, which means they've had a low back pain. You take out the tumor and all the draining lymph nodes. I have matched tumors, solid tumor and blood. So again, blood draws from preoperative, postoperative, and standard of care visits. Through TWIST, I've developed a 500 gene targeted panel that includes UMIs, and that's for both the DNA and the RNA. Uh, I'm very interested in expressed mutations. Um, and I'm using their uh, EMC uh, enzymatic uh, methylation approach, both for whole genome, which I plan to do fragmentomics with, and I take a snapshot of that, save it, and then I enrich against the panel and look at both the solid tumor and all these blood samples for the methylation profile according to the 400 million CPG marker panel. Um, and then um, all the NGS is performed on our NovaSeq. Uh, pipeline analysis, we'll be looking at somatic variant calling somatic CNVs using an ultra low pass. Fragmentomics, methylation, uh, tumor mutational burden, uh, microsatellite instability, uh, expressed mutations, and RNA fusion. And all the data from this will be stored in the blood pack uh, data warehouse. Uh, this uh, trial was uh, uh, funded uh, by the uh, federal government and, and, and the FDA. So in summary, uh, I try to show you the evolving landscape of precision oncology, how things are really changing uh, very re remarkably, and the role of uh, sequencing and very advanced molecular assays to do that. Um, liquid biopsies really have the, the way to really change, and they are changing the way cancer medicine is practiced.
we, we looked at uh, pre-analytical variables, analytical variables in a proficiency study, uh, the need for uh, robust uh, reference materials to test out. That's been done. It's been deposited. There's the Nature paper about it. And then in, I've shown you a roadmap for how some of these things are being used now with the TWIST technologies. And this is some uh, acknowledgments to the people at UAMS. This is not my, all of my work um, by any stretch of the imagination, but our, we had a tremendous division of thoracic uh, surgery led by Matt Scaliga, medical oncology by uh, uh, Costas. Uh, EJ Shin runs my lab, and then the sequencing center and the people involved in, in all that work. So thank you very much. Introduce our next speaker. Um, he's from my alma mater right next door at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, Fritz, he's an associate professor in the Human Genome Sequencing Center, and today he's going to talk to us about some advances in long read sequencing. So it's my great pleasure to be here, and thanks again uh, to Chris for inviting me. Um, to give this presentation, um, I'm, my name is Fritz Zirczak. I'm an associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine and also at Chunk at Rice University just across the street, so to speak. And so today I want to talk about a product, basically, or research that we have been conducting with the help from TWIST over the last couple of months. And um, we're going to release also some data at the upcoming ASHG about this. Um, and I'm hoping to also catch your attention over the next uh, half hour or so. Um, and it's really about, as, as it says in the title, closing the gap, solving complex medical relevant regions of the human genome. And what we mean with that is, of course, kind of these dark regions that are still escaping our characterization of short reads alone, um, but really with a focus on medical implications here. And I want to stress the point that, like, really our understanding of this complexity of the human genome or medical regions uh, or medical important genes is really driven by the technology that we have at hand, right? So in 1940s, 1980s, uh, basically, almost before my age, but we are, of course, applying this continuously these days as well. Carry typing helped us to uh, assess like large alterations in our chromosomes. And then fast forward in the 2000s, we finally had like microarrays where we can assess regions of the genome um, in sense of amplifications or deletions. And then in 2008, as, as our previous speaker also told about it, we had this revelation where we could finally sequence a whole genome with short reads, we're reading lots of new biology and insights. And then what I want to stress today more is then with the development of long reads, such as the Buck bio system, uh, this gives us a more insight into this repetitive ten and repeat regions that sometimes really play a key role, but also in the more complex um, alleles and mutations that, for example, are sometimes cancer drivers in bracket 2 for example, or other import or other have other important implications in different diseases for example, adult diseases all in general. And so my group, but also others over the last years have really, I think, showcased that long read sequencing is beneficial. So for example, for structure variants of 50 base pairs, a lot of large alterations in human genomes, um, you can identify around 20 to 23,000 of these alleles in a healthy individual. Whereas short reads, I always like to say I fell short, um, by only characterizing out 10 to 12,000 of these alleles. So we're really blind to almost half of the variants in the healthy human genome. And you can guess how this looks like in the deceased human genome, right? And what is really missing is mainly novel insertion elements. So like think about ALO insertions, think about line signs, right? That, that short reads really sometimes have really struggled to characterize, but also more complex events like staggered or chase and structure variants that are having implications in Mendelian diseases or cancer, for example. Um, we had a nice study with her two positive breast cancer um, with long reads that could show really complex events amplifying certain oncogenes. And then also other publications, for example, Mendekler et al. in uh, 2016, actually, that's a typo here, um, showed 193 medical important genes that we cannot characterize in full extent with short reads. So we really need this kind of novel technologies to address not just point mutations, but also alleles. And then this year, we contributed also to the um, publication of that complete human genome, uh, the T2T, the CHM13, uh, where we now have the possibility to assess centromeres and telomeres and, and see how these regions contribute to disease progression or, or, or other mechanisms. 
And so long bridge really gives us this all these opportunities, not only these, but also help us in assembly and phasing. So phasing here means that we can directly assess if two variants are co-occurring in the same molecule or not, which is important. Up to now, we mainly use population phase, uh, phasing, right? But we could assess common alleles in the population. But long reads allow us to do that also in rare and novel, uh, de novo alleles, so to speak. And so one of the things that these kind of developments, especially with Part Bio, really pushed forward, and that microbes invest in this genome on a bottle, uh, which provides genomic benchmarks. So think about it: if you are implanting a new uh, bioinformatics platform, if you are if you are releasing a new uh, sequencing instrument, and so on and so forth, you can go to genome bottle, um, purchase a sample, run it through your pipeline, compare it to to the, ben to the benchmarks that they are providing in terms of variant calling for SMVs, but also in SV SVs. So what we have released is on the SV side, structure variant side. Uh, the benchmark currently is the version 0.6, which has been uh, published here in Nature Biotech a few years back, and has the whole sequence resolved uh, structure variants for almost the entire genome, uh, covering around 90% of the entire genome. The, the thing how that was enabled was because we utilized multiple sequencing technologies to come to these um, conclusions. The downside, though, is that it's only covering insertions and deletions. So all the complex rearrangements and things are not covered by this benchmark. And what I always like to call out, it only covers boring regions, so to speak, of, despite our, I've been a co-author on this paper as well. On the SMB benchmark, we, we just updated this this year in the publication. We can now cover a little bit more, 92% of the genome, including MHC regions and more repeats. But again, it, it kind of lacks kind of a, medical focus. There are still regions in the genome that are important, like SMN1 and 2, HLA, LPA, and other genes that are, for us, um, speaking for us, really important in certain aspects and diseases. And so we, we settled out to kind of um, challenge ourselves to get these genes um, and see what we can do. So in, in total, um, what we came up with was this following pipeline. So we utilize uh, different uh, databases of medical genes and collected a total of around 5,000 medical important genes. Now, this includes OMEN and, and other common databases. And then we compared them, of course, to available benchmarks within the Genome and the Ball Consortiums. And so we ended up um, with around 400 genes uh, that are not covered because they're highly repetitive, they're highly complex, um, as I said, SMN1 and 2 and these, these kind of genes and try to formulate a genomic benchmark around them. And the way we did this was with the help from BugBio that we created a de novo assembly, um, also created that with other technologies, and then could report back the variants in most of these genes as benchmarkable. And so you can utilize this benchmark now for testing out your assays of uh, sequencing assays. One of the cool, curious things that we found in this process was actually errors in the human reference genome. There were multiple genes that were reported not just in one location, but in multiple locations. And there, here I'm not talking about normal pseudogenes or whatever. We really went back to the GRCH consortium and could verify that some of these genes um, are really reported duplicated, for example, on the left and the right side of the chromosome arms and chromosome 21. And these have profound effects, of course, in analysis, right? So here in the top, what I'm showing you here is different coverage panels uh, across different sequencing technologies. And due to this artifact in the human reference, uh, the Illumina reads can, for example, not map there at all. Whereas like uh, Bio reads can still map there despite being that region accidentally duplicated. So one of the side questions, of course, how can we fix that? And Cyram, who is over here with us, my postdoc, um, developed this program uh, that we called, that we recently renamed from Russia into Fix It Felix. Um, and so how it, how it kind of works is the following. So what I'm showing you here is an IGB screenshot again. On the top layer, you have Illumina reads. You see all these little uh, white boxes, I hope. In the background, you have to trust me on that. Um, and so these white boxes indicate a mapping quality of zero means they are equally mapping well to other regions of the genome, right? And then you see in the lower track, the boxes in gray, meaning they have now a unique mapping. And this is exactly what his tool does. So Cyrum has worked tremendously over his last weeks to identify these errors um, and resolve them in the GRCH48 
um, version of the reference, and then also introducing new, uh, new sequences that I'm coming to in a second. So you take his tool, you take a BAM file that you produced uh, recently, for example, and then you, his tool basically converts or changes uh, the BAM file from the upper version to a lower version where everything works, and you can call variants within around five minutes in total. And what this brings you is that you have a boost in actually identifying variants. So in red, here we show the performance of calling SMDs um, uh, in terms of um, F measurement, which is a measurement of accuracy for the non modified version. So here in red, as I said, original mapping. And then for the, in blue, is kind of a global remapping. So if you would remap the entire thing to the reference that we are providing now, it's a modified GSH38. And then in this Turkish uh, to keys uh, value um, table here is just this regional remapping that we can achieve in five minutes. Because as you know, remapping the entire genome will take a few hours actually. And then you see this kind of increased really in performance with these regions. And the same also in indel calling itself. So this is one type of the errors that we found. We also found a different type of errors where we actually have collapsed regions. So here, the gene is, is commonly uh, present in the, in the population, or should have been present in the reference genome, with like two or three copies of it, with different pseudogenes, for example. However, GSH38, for example, just represents two versions, two copies of this gene. And so we have this kind of collapse of, a, of another gene copy on top of itself. And what this causes is, again, errors in the, in the SNP calling. So in the top track, every tick here is a SNP call, and it's just too much to be realistic. And we found out it's not. But like again, with Cyrus tool, we can correct the bank file quite easily as I said in five minutes. And we can obtain the slip cause in the lower track um, um, that, that compared to a full de novo assembly of the human genome are correct. Um, the problem here and how we come across how do we solve this is actually by introducing new decoy sequences to the reference based on our work together with the T to T consortium. And so we see we get a little bit of a performance boost in substitutions, but also in indels. But like this comes also with the cost that this region now is not as unique as it was before, just because we introduced additional sequence to clean this up. Okay, so this, this was just like a side story, so to speak, but like really coming back to the benchmark because this is coming getting to be important in a, in a few minutes. So as I said, the benchmark currently um, uh, includes around 400 genes, 386. What was interesting is we could resolve all these genes um, apart for benchmark able quality apart from 122 genes. And these 122 genes is actually an interesting fact because we are able to resolve them in terms of an assembly or so, but like they have, they are so repetitive and so tricky that the variant representation is actually a challenging part. And so comparing these variants is something that we are currently working with, with Adam English, also part of my group. Um, um, and so we, they, those genes are not included in this benchmark. Nevertheless, these genes are really important across multiple diseases. What I'm trying to show here in this kind of circular diagram is the contribution of these genes across the 386 genes across multiple diseases. So you see the majority, for example, are, are important for neurological diseases. But like overall, we have all the different, well, most of the different disease types. I didn't plot out cancer here, but there are also multiple cancer genes in there, like TP, T10, or NT, or some kind of, I forgot the name. Sorry about that. Um, so this is great, but still, this benchmark is just like the first step. And that's, I think, all the why I'm talking today to you guys. Um, as you know, this really hopefully sparks. Uh, new developments because now we can benchmark these variants and, and assess the value of different technologies. One of the other thesis that Cyrom is currently working on is LPA. Um, as I said, this is a really important cardiovascular disease gene. The, trick, the tricky part here with LPA actually is mainly that you have this TIF2 repeat regions that are 5.5 kb and tenderly duplicated next to each other. So every human holds between 5 and 50 copies of these. 5.5 uh, kb regions, and the number of copies actually associates directly and significantly to your cardiovascular disease risk at birth. And it's highly polymorphic, and there are also some ethnicity interests. So that's why Washington Post, for example, just earlier this year released an article about the importance of 
of the LPA and its protein. And we really need uh, new methods to do that. And Siron in my group is working on kind of a graph representation where you have this distance here is represented as 5.5 kb. And you see all these different entanglements, which represents different haplotypes in the human population. We can use this kind of graph idea or representation to actually map short read data directly onto it and be able to analyze this. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible with short read data because that, of that high repetitiveness. But basically, the plot down here is showing you exactly that. So each red dot here represents the remapping of one individual in short read data, in which haplotypes are represented in this one individual across the different copies of this 5.5 kb region. So think about this graph here is really kind of a collapsed representation of this different copy number repeat. So, but we need to expand this. This is just like one scene that, that we really need to get right. So what, how do we kind of get beyond here, right? So how can we get kind of a routine assessment of these around 400 really important genes and improve our understanding about the diversity and therefore forming at some point an annotation um, uh, database itself as well, and have them included in routine, um, maybe even clinical uh, applications. This will require some lab optimizations, uh, as well as computational optimizations, right? And so this is really kind of a great pleasure here, because we were able to team up with Twist and, and as well as with Bio to address exactly that question. So together with Twist, um, we try to find a way to address these 400 genes in a most cost-efficient manner for long reads, right? Because like long reads are great, they're getting scalable and getting more and more matured over the last years. Still, it's expensive compared to kind of exon sequencing of Illumina and everything. I think that's fair to say, having some bio people as well here in the room. Um, but like what twist comes in here, right, is, is to enable us to target exactly the genes that we are interested in. Um, and really have a focused assay here. So like one of the scenarios you could think about, right, is to have your patient, have your human of interest, so to speak, sequence that with an inexpensive assay such as Illumina, right, and then add this kind of long read panel on top of it to kind of get the most for your money spent in these medical relevant machines. So we, we went out and like honestly great help from Tina and, and Holly and, and every from, everyone from the Twist team because these are the worst of the worst genes. These are really like the <laughs> things that no one of us really likes to touch. Um, and designed a panel for GSH38. So the total target of this panel is 22.2 F megabases. It actually includes 389. So for those of you that, that paid attention, those are three genes more than, than I said previously. Uh, we added GPA and other genes just because like GPA is also very interesting to me as, as, as someone that likes to study Parkinson. Um, we used sparse tiling probes. And out of these 22.2 MB, we could only not cover 271 KB. So it's a really kind of greatly covered panel. And the data that I'm going to show you today is actually from the first design. We are currently also going through a second design, optimizing this, these things further. And, and uh, I want to cite one of the one of the twist guys on our call is like, we really need to get this panel right because once we get this panel right, everything else is going to be easy. Um, <laughs> so how does this data look like? So um, first of all, I'm going to show you HG002. So this is the control sample from, from genome on the bottom that I was just talking about. And so the first plot I want to show you here is the log coverage on the, on the y-axis and then the percentage of genes on the x-axis. Uh, I'm sorry, the percent of CG and HG on the, on the x-axis. And you see that actually we have a very well covered, um, covering these genes very well uh, with the bliss twist panel design. It is true, like on the left, the lower left, you see the coverage um, across these genes that we are missing a few genes. So like, usually we miss like four or five genes in total, uh, totally in this um, panel design. And we are, as I said, we are going through a pre-design <clears throat> to improve this. But overall, the majority, vast, vast majority of all these 400 genes are very well covered um, in terms of coverage across the basis. Um, of these gene bodies. So this includes introns as well as exons, the entire gene body for, for all of these 400 genes. And then the majority of genes were also 
well covered. So the stash point here that you basically hardly can see is, is introducing 20x coverage with stock bio high fiber reads here. So really, a lot of these genes are very well covered. We have some outliers here. Um, these can actually be also true copy number variants. For example, in LPA, you would see such a peak in average coverage, right? Because you expect that in GCH38, there are only six copies of TIF2 present, and like a lot of lot of people have like tens um, of copies of of TIF2. How does it perform in variant calling? Um, as I said, we are still improving this, but actually it looks pretty good. Um, so the dashed line right now is around 50% F1 score for this panel. So most of the genes can be called very well and accurately um, with our design right now, but like we are still going over and improving this. 16 genes don't have an F score because seven of them don't have any variant in this one human sample compared to the reference. But as I said before, like few genes are also uncovered. Um, and then like some of these genes are also not callable or mappable right now with the mapping strategy that we employ. So how can we go beyond this again? Um, one of the things is of course the lab optimization. And, and here our team from the HGSC have been working really heavily with Tina. Uh, we had multiple runs uh, to test the design out. So the first one that I just showed you had actually an on-target rate of 52%, so much, much more than what you expect in the alumna. But again, well, maybe not surprising because these genes have a lot of pseudogenes, many of them have pseudogenes, and it's highly repetitive context. So later on, when we develop um, a little bit more optimized on the, on, the, on the lab techniques, not so much, actually no change in the panel, we could get this up to like 60% on target rate. And the latest ones are, I think, like 65, 67%. So Medhead is one of the main um, people working on the, the evaluation here, also in the room, one of my postdocs. And then we also tried uh, PCR-free um, with an eight-plex design, and that yielded around 54% on target rate. So we're getting better, and of course, higher on target rate means here a better cost-benefit of sequencing and multiplexing. So the thing I'm more versed to talk about is actually the computational side, because I'm a computational biologist. So, um, so the things I want to show you here is what is the improvement to compare to Illumina for real, right? So the first screenshot I'm showing here is over GPA. GPA is a really important gene, for example, Parkinson or MSA disease. And the cool thing with the panel is that we not just only capture the gene GPA, but also its pseudogenes. So on the top here, you see the Bartbile high fat panel with twist design. And on the bottom here, you see the Illumina whole genome round. And so you can see here that we have really dropouts and coverage dropouts uh, pretty clearly present on the Illumina side. So this is just one of the things. So like if you if you have new if you are specialized in neurological diseases, for example, Parkinson, so I'm sometimes often interested in this would be one motivation why you want to look at this panel when it comes out soon. Um, the other motivation might be something like this here, where in purple you see clear novel insertion sites. Uh, represented in the biodata that we are otherwise pretty blind to with Illumina. That's the reason for that is simply that the insertions here, 314 base pairs, 114 base pairs, are longer than the read length in Illumina. So how should that be represented with the Illumina sequencing technology? Plus you see like coverage differences in the Illumina itself. And then the, the third one on the lower right, I have to go over there, otherwise I don't see it, um, is again showing a, a nice 300 base pair roundish insertion the clear side where like the Illumina just indicates maybe there is something but cannot resolve these insertions directly. So we really think that this panel is really boosting our ability to assess these important genes. Um, where we are currently struggling a little bit and we are working on this massively is if a mapping and single nuclear calling or structural barren calling strategy is enough or not. And this is something that we are assessing because like something like assembly in these regions would also work a lot and help us to represent these more complex variants. And so here again, I'm showing you an IGV screenshot for anyone that uh, knows me right now, I love to show these IGV screenshots. I hope they are not too confusing. And this time it's actually about LPA that I've been talking about. So here you can see in the coverage, uh, this peak here, indicating these copy number variants in the kif 2 region that I've been talking about. The cool thing, this is data from the panel directly, 
is that we cannot just assess this gene and map in this kind of high repetitive area here, uh, but we can also face it. So like the colors here in brown versus this kind of purplish color here indicates actually reads from two different haplotypes on this particular human sample. So we cannot just address the copy number, we can also face uh, the, the patient's data and assess which allele is in what, and maybe most important for LPA, assess which DNA copy holds how many uh, copy numbers from TIF2 region directly, giving you a much more precise indication for cardiovascular disease risk. Um, as I said, we are working on the assembly incorporations and structure bearing calling and phasing a little bit more to make that whole automatic. And then together with Park Bio, we're also working on specialized tools. They have been uh, really pushing hard, which is a great collaboration with them on specialized tools, such as for the studies that we just heard in the beginning of this talk today, um, but also, for example, LPA. And so here you, you get the point that I'm really fixated about LPA these days. Um, here they have actually a graph genome representation of LPA uh, itself. You see here the copy number variants represented in a graph structure of this PF2 region. And the cool thing is about this representation is similar to Cyril's approach, is that we can see all these different rotations, not just in terms of copy number, which is this kind of bubble here, but also in terms of SNPs and other indels in this important gene. And this can be applied to many other genes where mapping, for example, is not just enough to compare that. And here you have again one more screenshot of LPA. Up top here with the high fi panel and the lower here with Illumina, where you can see here we have really sparse coverage to not mapping coverage in this critical area where we want to assess TIF2 copy number repeats. And so this is really a great collaboration with TWIST because like without TWIST, this all wouldn't have been possible, right? We would have to go back to whole genome sequencing, which is maybe better for bug bio, but more expensive for us. Um, so what are the kind of future steps in summary? Well, scale and cost efficient. Um, we really try to uh, provide this method and provide this panel together with TWIST to you guys, who hopefully enable cool new science and hopefully discover new um, variants and effects of these variants in, across multiple diseases and also including cancer. Um, what we are currently working hard on is the analytical pipeline to have on the release from the panel also kind of a software component for the analysis of these genes available. And that's, this will be actually maintained from our bio as far as I'm aware right now. If you're not getting, okay, he doesn't know. Uh, so that's, that, that's still what I negotiated with them, that they are going to take care of the customers for us, which is great negotiation tactic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm, I'm really excited. So like uh, with this panel, we also have just seen recent data that we can actually resolve SNN 1 and 2. Um, just with this panel sequencing LP I showed you already. Um, GPA I showed you already. So there are really some key genes that, that many of us are interested here. And with this panel, we also kind of allow them to have kind of a large scale application and apply this panel on a more routine way of, of assessing these important genes. And so with that, I want to acknowledge many, many people, of course, um, on the HGST side, Medhat Mahmoud, my postdoc here, is really pushing the analytics of it. I also showed you uh, data from Sirem's work. Um, besides that, many thanks also to the center, which the Gibbs, Donna, Ginger, all have, Harsha have all been really instrumental of pushing this forward and developing um, these things. On the bike bio side, I think Mike Abel and Sarah and Chow is really pushing this forward, and Chow and Sean and us have a lot of calls about uh, analytical side. And then on the twist side, we really were, had a great collaboration and still ongoing, honestly, um, especially with Holly and Tina um, pushing that forward. And then in the end of it, because like this is also an online thing, I'm always looking for postdocs or students. Um, so plus, just please reach out if you're interested in work like that. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, so we're gonna take some questions. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Don if you wanna come up. Um, so yeah, we'll take questions uh, from the room. Does anybody have any questions for any of the speakers?
how much uniformity do you think over? How do you think you can enforce it uniformity of collection and processing across multiple centers and to assure that it was collected in a proper format? I don't know if you want to do PAC scanning, if you want to do the EDPA too, is there anything else that's currently available? But I see a problem with that, that cohort study of doing it across the world like that. Beautiful, but you have to make sure that the collection methods were correct, that the paperwork is actually valid. Um, I've seen paperwork that's come in that we can't even vouch for that. And it's obviously not what we have in our hands. So where do you see the challenges on maybe a collection device that you would recommend outright for that kind of study? So I can tell you what we did, and this is through um, the collaboration with Blood Pack, which again is an organization, you know, it's on the web, bloodpack.org. And um, all of the uh, publications there can be gotten. But um, uh, I kind of benefited uh, from a very extensive study that USC did, Peter Kuhn and uh, Jim Hicks and uh, Anand Kolishar, <clears throat> where they were funded to look at all different collection methods, EDA tubes, stretch tubes, this and that. And then processing the samples at different time points, seeing you know, where are the fence posts, where are the real inflection points. And so, uh, cut to the chase, um, I think that the best way to do it is to use a strict tube or some equivalent where you have a preservative inside. And um, that's what I did for my sample collection. Now, it, it is more. Uh, a little bit more expensive than a red top. I think they cost between six to eight dollars a tube. The only thing that you had, but then you have theoretically up to 14 days to process the blood. It has a fixative in it. What you need to do is you need to invert the tube 10 times. So I, I will just say that there were a couple of nuclear explosions in my office. <laughs> When I found out people in the ward were not burning things and they were sending it up to the lab and it was a gigantic clot. So it's easy to see if it wasn't done right, but then that sample is not useful. You need to really uh, stabilize all the white cells, buffy coat, you need to stabilize that and the fixative will do that. And so what we normally do is, um, although I have up to 10 days, we usually process it between two to three days using the uh, STRAC protocol, which is you know, two centrifugations, and then we um, <clears throat> save the buffy coats. We always save the buffy coats, and then we take the plasma out, and we aliquot that down to one to two of ML and put it at minus 80. And um, now I'm pulling things out of the freezer. Some of these things are five or six years old, and now, the important thing is before you run the sample and before you start to expend a lot of money on a CFDNA protocol where you're going to have to do 20,000 X coverage, you want to really look at the FA trace in the qubit. So you should be able to see a characteristic peak around 170 base pairs and then in two to three multiples, 340, 510. And you know what? If you do it right, you'll see it. <laughs> if it's not done right, you start to see uh, you know, other stuff. But um, we're going through everything now and pulling it. We just ran, ran this. And so it's very important to say, yes, there is CFDNA in there. You know, I see that peak. And so, so we use the um, <clears throat> fragment analyzer, which is a capillary electrophoresis uh, system, which is extremely sensitive, and uh, the company was bought by Agilence, now Agilence, but that's what we're using, that in the qubit, to uh, really do that first pass, make sure you know what you're working with, so that you're not wasting time and money, which is precious. Yes. I have a question for the long-week panel. Uh, that's the you know, so that he is going to find you. I did find a 
Uh, there are for sure repeats in there. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm like 90% confident. Um, there are a lot of yeah, there are a lot of STRs in there. I'm not. I would have to go back and check if they're trying to keep that repeats, but there are for sure in there. Um, you mean in terms of variant calling directly? Coverage. So the coverage looks actually really amazingly good for, for all of them, for most of them. We have the, the genes where we have some dropouts on the probes. Um, we haven't characterized a systematic problem there. Um, and as I said, we just went through a redesign where they reshuffled the probes and, and adopted more to GC biases. Um, but like all what we see is only like four or five genes that are completely not covered. But I don't think that the STRs are contributing much to that problem. Uh, the design is 22B. Oh, each, uh, the probe itself? Um, I honestly don't. 120 base pairs. Oh, it's right? Yeah, so yeah, they're all 120. What's the minimum number of probes? So we have some very short genes where I remember to just see like two or three probes as well if I remember correctly. But like we also have like these very long genes where we don't have like really lots of probes. Yes. So these are, uh, so how reliable is it like comparing, let's first talk about comparing tissue versus uh, the blood to match, things like that. Now it's all a function of uh, what is the tumor and what is the burden of disease, okay? so. You may have a tumor that sheds a lot. Lung cancer sheds a lot. Gliomas do not shed. You don't understand biologically why that is. But um, it is accurate. Uh, we do now have FDA approved tests. And when you put an assay through FDA, you know, first thing they're looking at is uh, the uh, analytical uh, reproducibility, the accuracy of, of what's being called. Um, as we move now into more challenging areas, okay, with uh, earlier and early detection, maybe even screening methods, what, what happens is the, uh, the SNP that you would like to see in the serum becomes signal-to-noise ratio becomes very challenging, and you have these stochastic events now that are uh, present when you do your sample prep. So it becomes very extremely challenging. So shift to another molecule. So that's why when you look at what uh, Galieri is doing and the um, Garden uh, Lunar Two and things like that, they're 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 looking. Sure, they're looking at DNA, but but they're looking at fragmentation patterns via the fragmentomics, which <clears throat> Victor. Uh, Lescu from Hopkins came out with the big paper a couple of years ago. And now Delphi is the company that's grown out of that. And, and also these methylation patterns, which the uh, Grail assay, Galieri, is, is really looking at where they have this multiple cancer early detection assay where they can screen for up to 50 cancers. So they're looking at presence of cancer along with the tissue of origin is very important. So um, this is here now for some cancers where we have known screening like mammography, colonoscopy, things like that. Um, those are good, those are still gold standards. But for other cancers like pancreatic where we don't really have any good screening assay and most people present with stage four disease and uh, the therapeutic options are not great. Uh, this could be a real game changer if you could detect it early. And, but when you look at the Gal Galieri results, what 
the, uh, the accuracy of what they're seeing in stage one through stage four varies significantly from like less than 20% all the way to above 90%, less than 20% in stage one to greater than 90% in stage four. So it's, um, it's moving in the right way. It's certainly not perfect, but um, compared to what we had before, it's a gigantic move forward. And, and I think that these, see the thing with the screening assays are they're difficult to do because you really, you know, the, the, the ultimate uh, uh, metric for the screening assay is, does it save lives? And so now, now you have to follow somebody for 20 or 30 years. So the NIH is getting involved in that. And um, there's been all sorts of uh, meetings with top leadership because these assays, again, are ramming their way into the clinic. Um, you know, you can pay for the galley ARI assay. I think it's a little less than $1,000. You know, you can have that. You know, some picking up a cancer in stage one you know, it is much more amenable to a cure, maybe even with a simple surgery. So we want to start doing that. So, however, you don't want this stuff to be overhyped and to the technology to get a black guy because it's introduced too quick because, you know, the people can make a lot of money. Um, so it, it, there has to be a balancing act and it has to be done in a controlled ass, uh, fashion through clinical trials where things are looked at very carefully. All right, are there any more questions? All right, if not, uh, we'll wrap up. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining us online. Um, we'll be hanging around if you have any more questions for Twister or Don or Britt, so thank you.